The situation in China regarding the epidemic has been a major focus over the past week. There are reports of a significant rise in deaths, overwhelmed crematoriums, and the emergence of mass new graves in rural areas. The widespread fear of sudden deaths is now casting a dark shadow over the entire mainland, marking the return of a nightmarish scenario. Simultaneously, the Chinese economy continues to decline, with foreign capital continuing to withdraw. The three major stock indices in China continue to plunge sharply, prompting significant sell-offs by major players in the industry. Protests and strikes are breaking out across the country as factories shut down en masse, leading to widespread wage arrears. Unemployment is rampant, particularly in major cities like Shenzhen, Guangdong, Guangzhou, and Shanghai. Homeless workers are forced to sleep on the streets and face eviction by the authorities. China is entering a second wave of the financial crisis, marked by the successive collapses of real estate companies and shadow banks. A series of bank directors are collapsing, with some even resorting to jumping from buildings. This tragic situation is expected to persist in the foreseeable future. Internationally, awareness is growing as the United States continuously strikes strong blows on the CCP, causing it to be overwhelmed. Xi Jinping is running around hectically, seeking assistance not only from the US but also from Vietnam to salvage his shaky seat of power that is about to collapse. The question arises, how much time does Xi Jinping have left? China is on the brink of a significant change, and it is crucial for the Chinese people to quickly recognize the malevolence of the CCP, withdraw from it and its affiliated organizations, and choose a better future for themselves. All the information mentioned will be updated in our weekend news bulletin today. We invite you to stay tuned for further updates. Chongqing crematoriums overwhelmed, citizens die suddenly. The epidemic is unfolding in an extremely severe manner on the Chinese mainland. Chongqing is facing another significant outbreak, and local residents are reporting overwhelming conditions in some funeral homes, and sudden deaths of citizens. However, this information is being suppressed. In more detail, a resident of the Nanan district in Chongqing, named Chen Xin, recently shared with Epic Times reporters that about half of the people in his niece's workplace have come down with a fever and a cold. Meanwhile, the crematorium is handling more bodies than usual, and the memorial halls are full, indicating a higher number of deaths among the elderly. He recalled that a few days ago, a friend of his passed away. Although the Shikyapu crematorium is closer to them, they had to go to the farther Jiannan crematorium because the memorial hall at Shikyapu was full, with no available space. Notably, Chen Xin informed reporters that on December 11, a woman in her 30s died after running a few steps to catch a bus. Mr. Fang, a resident of Anhui, shared that a few days ago, a five-year-old girl suddenly passed away. It took half an hour, and she ceased breathing. No examination or autopsy was conducted. From last year to this year, there has been a notable increase in cases of strokes, heart attacks, and sudden deaths. Among his friends and neighbors, there have been seven or eight such cases. According to these residents, such incidents cannot be reported. News media has many red lines, and reporting on certain matters, such as real estate and official corruption, could result in the loss of jobs for journalists and editors, who are then left covering only inconsequential topics. Furthermore, high medical fees also plunge people into desperate situations. On December 11, a mother from Chongqing posted a brief video on social media, reporting that her 10-year-old daughter had a fever. She took her to the pediatric department of Chongqing Fifth People's Hospital for medical attention. The registration fee was approximately 2.1 US dollars, and the blood test fee was about 10 US dollars and 23 cents. She was prescribed four boxes of medication, totaling 16 US dollars and 5 cents, with an additional coordinated payment of 3 US dollars and 3 cents. The overall cost came to 31 US dollars and 41 cents, about 223.86 yuan. She posed the question, with such expenses, can you still afford to get sick? Hubei epidemic escalates, new graves in mountainous areas are increasing sharply. 
The epidemic continues to escalate in China, resulting in overcrowded hospitals in Wuhan and rural clinics in Hubei. Particularly, weather changes since the beginning of winter have led to widespread symptoms of colds and fever. Reports highlight a growing number of deaths among the elderly and instances of sudden death in young children. Mr. Tan, a villager from Badong County, Enchi, Hubei, revealed to NTD Television on December 14 that in rural areas, the deceased are buried in the ground and numerous new graves have been added recently. He mentioned that there have been numerous deaths in his area this year. During this period, the elderly have experienced cerebral infarctions, and funerals are conducted at home. Burying people here doesn't require approval. In his mountainous area, individuals find their own burial spots, deep burying coffins, one in the east, one in the west. There have been dozens of deaths. Over the three years of the epidemic, winter and spring have seen more deaths, with the highest number occurring last year. Mr. Su, a villager from Dog County, Xiaogon, Hubei, disclosed that in economically challenged rural areas, there is a lack of funds, they can only go to small clinics. Two days ago, a four-year-old died with no known illnesses before. If they had a cold, they would go for an injection, and within a few minutes after the injection, they died. Recently, a distressed mother posted, inquiring about the nature of the virus in Wuhan. She has had a high fever for half a month. Despite numerous hospital visits, no diagnosis was found, and she expressed fear of sudden death if the situation persists. Subsequent comments unveiled the severity of the epidemic in various parts of China, with many children facing recurrent fevers, some schools suspending classes, and others resorting to online learning. Hubei police officer collapses suddenly, amidst a recent surge in deaths among CCP officers. The epidemic broke out in China, and sudden deaths of police officers occurred more frequently. On December 13, a video circulated on Chinese social media, depicting an event from December 5 in Xianning, Hubei. While conducting interrogation procedures, a police officer suddenly exhibited severe coughing. Following this, he clutched his chest with his left hand, stood up, and leaned against a wall, attempting to move outdoors. However, his steps became unsteady, and he abruptly collapsed at the door, hitting his head on the wall, with eyes rolling back and limbs stiffening. The video footage indicates that the police officer is not very old, in his middle years. According to the Hubei Daily, the collapsed police officer was taken to the hospital, and doctors initially diagnosed him with a seizure. However, many netizens expressed skepticism, as they believed his symptoms did not align with a seizure but resembled the conditions of several police officers who had suddenly died during the pandemic. In fact, amidst the pandemic, there has been a notable increase in the deaths of CCP police officers. Recently, with the coronavirus situation escalating in China, many young and middle-aged police officers have experienced sudden deaths. Former mainland media personality Zhao Lanjian posted a message on X platform on November 6, stating that following the sudden death of Li Keqiang, netizens discovered that numerous police officers have also suddenly died recently. A large number of police officers dying in a concentrated manner is not quite normal. According to the image data he shared, these CCP police officers are quite young, and most of them suddenly died around October of this year. Zhao has mentioned that it is widely known that police officers enjoy certain privileges, including access to good food, drinks, and free medical care. This leads to the question. Why are these young police officers succumbing to death one after another? In the three years since the outbreak of the coronavirus, numerous incidents of police officers suddenly dying have occurred. According to the Chinese Ministry of Public Security, in 2021, a total of 392 people died, on duty, and in 2022, 487 police officers and auxiliary police died. Some commentators suggest that a concentrated death toll among police officers could adversely impact the morale of the knife handle troops. To maintain stability, authorities have only released partial information about the deaths and concealed the true extent of the epidemic. 
The actual number of police officers who have contracted and died from the virus may be much higher. Senior media person. If the CP imposes blockade, significant issues could arise. Amid the epidemic spreading across China at the same time as the one-year anniversary of the CCP, lifting the zero-COVID lockdown, concerns are growing among the public that the authorities might reimpose lockdown measures. Former Chinese media professional Xiao Lanjian warns that if the CCP takes such action again, a major crisis could erupt in China. In an interview with the Vision Times on December 9, Xiao Lanjian stated, We are at a critical juncture now. People's patience reached its limit during the white paper movement. Chinese people have collectively endured, especially withdrawing. Even so, they cannot endure it and more and less life and spirit are on the brink. Otherwise, they won't take action. Although the white paper movement was quickly suppressed, the societal pressure relief valve has already manifested. As long as there is a bit more societal pressure approaching the level of the white paper movement, China will undoubtedly witness a violent revolution. With years of experience as a journalist in China, Zio has a profound understanding of the Chinese people. He believes that due to decades of brainwashing, the average Chinese person has become numb and generally lacks insight into social issues. Awakening may only happen after experiencing significant hardship, and the three-year zero COVID policy and the white paper movement are crucial turning points. Furthermore, the zero COVID approach has severely impacted the Chinese economy. Zeo estimates the CCP might face internal collapse, such as being unable to pay civil servants with all the military and law enforcement having no funds. If such a social crisis occurs, the day when the CQ falls from power is not far off. Zio is one of the earliest independent media figures to issue warnings about the Chinese epidemic on social media. As early as mid to late November, he revealed that the pneumonia epidemic in China was intensifying with a tense atmosphere in Dalian and people starting to die. However, official information was blocked and any online content related to the epidemic was completely deleted from the entire internet. During the interview, Zio also revealed that his heightened awareness of epidemics originated from the 2003 SARS outbreak. During that time, he worked as a journalist in Beijing, equipped with a camera engaging with hospital directors and doctors. He witnessed unique situations, such as the deserted Chang Zane Street in Beijing spanning kilometers. In the event of an outbreak in a community, armed police or doctors would encircle and seal off the affected area. Recalling an incident near the Gaibidian subway station in Beijing across the Tongli River, Zeo Longjian observed individuals in white attire carrying stretchers, with at least three people being transported, while armed police stood guard nearby. Witnessing such scenes at a young age was profoundly unsettling for him, leaving him unsure of what to do. Later, he intentionally contacted the head of the inspection department at a specific hospital, which was entirely closed at the time, exclusively admitting SARS patients. According to him, the hospital's air was filled with viruses, leading to the extensive use of disinfectant. Even before the epidemic concluded, the disinfectant had corroded the hospital's drainage pipes. During that period, when Beijing Youth Daily and China Youth Daily conducted interviews, they went there to capture photos, fabricate propaganda, and intentionally refrained from reporting the severity of SARS, all in an effort to portray a positive image related to the treatment of SARS patients. Zio also recognized the societal impact of authorities concealing the truth. Despite reaching out to many friends, they struggled to comprehend the imminent crisis, with many dismissing his warnings as jokes. From SARS to COVID-19, and now the current wave of unknown pneumonia, the CP's past pattern of withholding information and imposing strict control over society persists. Concerns are mounting that this winter will be exceptionally challenging for the Chinese people Dr. Lin Exia Aksu, a virologist in the United States, discussed the epidemic in Asia, highlighting the heightened vulnerability of children. One contributing factor is the three-year lockdown, which has compromised the immune systems of Chinese children, deprived of sufficient sunlight and outdoor activities, confined at home during crucial developmental stages. 
children face hindrances in exposure to various pathogens, impeding the maturation of their immune systems. If a simultaneous outbreak of multiple pathogens occurs, children may struggle to withstand it. The emergence of white lung could result in a death rate ranging between 20 and 40. New research report, CCP identifies suppression of Phelan Gong as top priority. The Phelan Dafa Information Center published a research report on December 6, revealing that since 2017, official documents, speeches, and directives from at least 12 provinces in mainland China indicate that the Chinese Communist Party has identified the suppression of Phelan Gong as a top priority for both central and local authorities. The research report cites over 20 references, highlighting, the CCP's forceful campaign to eliminate Falun Gong is considered within the party as a fundamental component for controlling the population, sustaining political power, and upholding ideological dominance. In August 2020, Zhao Kaji, the then Minister of Public Security of the CCP and State Councilor, addressed the work situation of 2019 during a session of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, a critical legislative meeting. Zhao emphasized measures to suppress Falun Gong and other prescribed religious groups, subsequently touching upon other security measures, including initiatives related to anti-corruption and counterterrorism. This was one of several public work reports by high-ranking officials at significant party gatherings in recent years that explicitly discussed the CCP's efforts to suppress Falun Gong in Beijing. From 2017 to 2021, the Supreme People's Court and the Supreme People's Procuratorate of the CCP consistently mentioned in their work reports to the National People's Congress the necessity to actively participate and intensify efforts in combating illegal religious activities, resolutely punishing illegal crimes related to Falun Gong and other prohibited beliefs, prevent them from becoming prominent factors affecting political security. On April 15, 2021, during a press conference for China's National Security Education Day, the Ministry of National Defense of the CCP presented the achievements in safeguarding the country's political security over the past seven years and outlined future work. The first policy implementation goal mentioned in the conference report focuses on Falun Gong and other banned religious groups, emphasizing deepening education and transformation. This phrase refers to the use of brutal methods to compel individuals to abandon their beliefs and express allegiance to the CCP. Mr. Levi Browd, executive director of the Phelan Dafa Information Center, stated, The results of this study demonstrate to the international community that the persecution is ongoing, with millions of innocent people across China enduring cruel punishment. According to recent statistics from Minghui.net, over the past 24 years, more than 5,010 Falun Gong practitioners have been persecuted to death. In just one women's prison in Liaoning province, 63 practitioners have been persecuted to death. Due to the CCP's persecution and information blockade, these figures represent only the tip of the iceberg. Why does the CCP consider the suppression of Falun Gong a top priority? In response to this question, Mr. Browd explained to the Epoch Times that the persecution of Falun Gong by the CCP is rooted in the nature of the CCP and the essence of communism, which stand in opposition to the principles of truthfulness, compassion, forbearance practiced by Falun Gong. During the initial phases of the persecution, the official media of the CCP admitted that the values upheld by Falun Gong practitioners, truth, compassion, and forbearance, stood in stark contrast to the Marxist ideology of the regime, which was committed to deceit, violence, and struggle. The CCP perceives Falun Gong practitioners' efforts to expose the truth about the regime and encourage people to quit the CCP as a threat. For nearly 25 years, Falun Gong practitioners have persistently clarified the truth at the grassroots level, debunking CCP propaganda against Falun Gong and revealing the brutal persecution against innocent individuals. Since 2005, practitioners have utilized the nine commentaries on the Communist Party to outline the broader acts of violence by the CCP against the Chinese people and encourage them to quit the CCP, its youth organizations, and affiliated groups, known as Three Withdrawals. The publication of the nine commentaries on the Communist Party in 2005 triggered a widespread wave of people withdrawing from affiliation with the CCP, with over 420 million Chinese people declaring their withdrawals to date. 
With the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, some Falun Gong practitioners, acting as citizen journalists, documented and disseminated pandemic-related information. The CCP perceives these efforts as a broader threat to its power, leading to more severe repression by the security apparatus. Wu Xiaoping, a former Chinese human rights lawyer now residing in the United States, emphasized that the CCP persecutes Falun Gong because it views them as a threat, even though practitioners do not see themselves as such. He described the CCP as an irrational and extremely terroristic regime, an enemy of humanity and goodness, and a representative of Satan. The CCP does not allow the existence of true values or anything considered good, making the persecution of Falun Gong a manifestation of its oppressive nature. To comprehend China, one must understand the CCP's persecution of Falun Gong. Mr. Browd remarked, Many concerns that Western policymakers and scholars believe trouble the leaders of the CCP corruption, terrorism, and so forth, are actually ranked lower or at least secondary to Falun Gong. Hence, in seeking to grasp China and the endeavors of the CCP security apparatus to uphold political security, one must commence by examining the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners within mainland China. He proposed that the United States and the international community should broaden sanctions against the CCP. He said, any actions addressing severe human rights violations by the CCP, measures to halt these transgressions, which include sanctions against CCP officials, must encompass Falun Gong. Protest against rent hikes, over a thousand merchants strike in world's largest pearl market. China's economy is taking a hit, and the surge in rent at shopping malls across various regions is sparking widespread protests. On December 9, there was a video posted on X platform under the title Yesterday, Record of Chinese Civil Group Struggle. The video reported a six-fold increase in the rent of East China International Jewelry City situated in Shangzhou Town, Zhuji City, Shaoxing City, Zhujiang Province. Reacting to this steep rise in rent, on December 8, more than a thousand merchants, unable to cope with the soaring costs collectively shut down their businesses and went on strike upon learning that the mayor was planning to inspect the jewelry city. Their protest was aimed at opposing the drastic increase in rent. In the video, all the shops in the market have shut down, yet there's still a bustling crowd. A woman expressed, the pearl market, the exorbitant stall prices, we merchants can't take it anymore. We've all closed down, it's unbearable. Zhuji City holds the global title as the pearl capital, boasting the world's biggest pearl market and acting as the primary hub for distributing freshwater pearl raw materials. The East China International Jewelry City, founded in 2006, spans a massive 1.2 million square meters with an investment exceeding 3 billion yuan, approximately 417.34 million US dollars. This hub serves as a professional epicenter for the production and processing of pearls and jewelry, distribution and logistics, brand exhibitions and trade. This market has a global reach, spanning over 60 countries and regions, including the United States, Japan, Russia, and Southeast Asia. It dominates the annual trade in freshwater pearls, making up 80% of the country's total and over 75% of the world's freshwater pearl trade. However, at this moment, according to merchants, the exorbitant stall prices are unbearable, leading to the closure of all shops in the market. Over a thousand merchants in Hebei's Langfang stage mass strike in protest of rent hikes. As previously reported, on November 13, there were reports online that more than a thousand merchants from Xiangha Center, an international auto parts city in Langfang City, Hebei Province, collectively went on strike to protest against a breach of contract and rent increase. A merchant mentioned that they had just paid rent and management fees in October, but in November, Auto Parts City violated the contract and demanded an additional management fee of over 20,000 yuan, approximately 2,783 US dollars. The video footage shows a large group of presumed merchants gathering in front of the Auto Parts City gate, collectively shouting, check out. Check out. Besides reports of merchant strikes, there have been numerous accounts of strikes by mainland workers in recent days. China's current economic challenges, with companies laying off employees, suspending operations, relocating, or taking extended holidays, 
have led to widespread strikes affecting employees' lives. As per online reports, Bowie Shoe Factory in Yangzhou City, Jiangsu Province, announced the closure of domestic factories by year-end. Due to the company's failure to provide satisfactory compensation plans, workers have initiated strikes in protest. In Dongwan City, Guangdong Province, Beiwan Precision Industry Company, Limited, engaged in the production and sale of hardware and plastic products and daily appliances, after relocating its factory, did not compensate workers who refused to work in the new area. Dozens of workers went on a two-day strike on December 6 and 7, blocking the gate and displaying banners on the factory roof to protest. On December 5, near Shizhongnan Plaza in Chang'an Town, Dongwan, Guangdong Province, some manufacturing workers, not receiving compensation for factory relocation, climbed rooftops to protest their rights. The video shows many onlookers below, with police officers present. Some netizens commented, massive unemployment, followed by widespread hunger, then widespread social unrest, and even a large-scale civil war. Zero COVID, the entire society goes on strike, market strike, and class strike. Now the CCP has no enterprises to collect taxes, no money to pay wages, and no international friends. It's impressive, isn't it? Some said, resistance, if not, they will cut even harder. The mainland will soon be in chaos. It's important to note that the specific content, time, and location of the above video messages cannot be independently verified at present. Over a hundred workers in Dongwan protest on factory rooftop for four days and four nights. A surge in social discontent in China has triggered protests, notably by nearly a hundred employees of Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, in Dongwan City, Guangdong Province, protesting consistently for four days and four nights. On December 14, a video posted on YouTube by the channel yesterday revealed that around a hundred workers in Dongwan City initiated a collective protest on December 11. They gathered on the rooftop of an eight-story factory building, urging the company for fair compensation. The workers distributed flyers, resembling falling snowflakes, and one employee shouted, Jump off! Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, recently relocated its factory equipment to Guizhou without compensating its workers. Instead, the company implemented measures such as halting social security payments, blocking signals, installing surveillance cameras, and cutting off power and water supplies, pressuring employees into involuntary resignations. The workers, in this rights protection movement, expressed determination for a fair resolution. As of the 14th, this action endured for four days and four nights. Government officials and police pledged to address the workers' demands, yet no substantial resolution has materialized. Dongwan Ruilita Glass Cover Plate Technology Company, Limited, a subsidiary of Ruida International Group, established in 2011, is a high-tech enterprise with clientele including Samsung, LG, Xiaomi, Lenovo, Huawei, BBK, BYD, and Meizu. In the context of a severe economic downturn on the mainland, businesses face a crisis, resulting in frequent wage arrears and mass layoffs, leading to consecutive protests. Additionally, ongoing stability efforts and rigorous scrutiny by Chinese authorities mean that only a fraction of incidents makes it onto the internet. According to a report by Voice of America on August 28, China dissent monitor by Freedom House recorded 2,803 instances of dissent, both offline and online, in China during H1 2023, with over 30,000 participants. Labor disputes in China surged since December, with at least 93 offline labor rights protests in June, a 2.35-fold increase from last year. The ongoing indiscriminate suppression of protests by the CCP indicates a profound insecurity in governance. Confirmed, Hua Xiao Bank Tianjin Branch President Incident Signals Unprecedented Economic Chill On December 10, Chinese media confirmed the death of Gong Donji, the head of Hua Xiao Bank's Tianjin Branch. Apart from speculations about whether Gong Donji's demise was a suicide, there are growing concerns about a financial crisis in China. 
Additional details suggest that the crisis in the financial system has widened, resulting in tangible economic repercussions in China, with even the middle class facing the threat of bankruptcy. Huaxia Bank, the fifth listed bank in China, has the Shugong Group, affiliated with the Beijing State-Owned Assets Supervision and Administration Commission of the Chinese Communist Party, as its largest shareholder. Gong Donji previously held the position of head at Huaxia Bank's Beijing branch and was transferred to the Tianjin branch at the end of 2020. Following the news, overseas netizens disclosed rumors suggesting a comprehensive crisis at Huaxia Bank's Tianjin branch. China's trust in banking industry has been grappling with a series of crises due to the real estate sector's downturn. In August of this year, reports surfaced of depositors being unable to withdraw funds from Huaxia Bank's Changchun branch, with some depositors reportedly losing up to 1.5 million yuan, nearly 210,000 US dollars. However, it remains unclear whether Gong Donji's incident is directly connected to these issues. Real estate bubble bursts, layoffs sweep companies, and foreign capital withdrawals, China's economy riddled with holes. After Evergrande's shockwave set off the first wave of China's financial crisis last year, Forbes, an American financial and business magazine, observed that China's current situation is akin to a textbook example illustrating how a financial crisis unfolds. One failure serves as the catalyst for a series of subsequent failures, and Evergrande's bankruptcy has raised anxieties within the credit system. Given the widespread involvement of most banks in the real estate sector, Chinese depositors are apprehensive about the safety of their funds. Unilateral restrictions on withdrawals imposed by Chinese banks have only heightened these concerns. When people worry about the security of their bank deposits, they tend to slow down or cease consumption, leading to a significant economic impact caused by financial issues. Recently, there have also been some accounts from individuals in China that shed light on the grim economic circumstances faced by its citizens. For instance, a brother of AX user, who has spent 25 years working in the economic sector in Shanghai, specializing in investment projects and IPO financing, possesses properties like a villa in Songjiang and a luxury apartment in the city center. His son is enrolled in a private high school in the United States, and his wife is a full-time homemaker. Lately, the brother expressed doubts about his company's ability to endure until the Chinese New Year in February of the coming year. All of his personal investments are tied up in real estate. If the company opts to halt salary payments from December to February next year, issues with mortgage payments and the child's expenses become significant challenges. The brother also remarked that the year-end prospects for major banks are not optimistic. According to independent commentator Kai Shinkuin, the brother of this individual is a high-end gold-collar worker in Shanghai. Normally, the economic downturn will hit ordinary people first, then white-collar workers, the middle class, and then gold-collar workers and high-end gold-collar workers. Now even high-end gold-collar workers have been affected. How many people can escape this economic winter? Some netizens analyze that the real estate market within the country is truly in dire straits. It's not about how much the price has dropped, but rather that no one has the willingness to buy a house anymore. Real estate agencies have gone bankrupt by at least 90%. With the further decline of the economy, more and more people will not be able to pay off their mortgages. If this netizen's prediction is true, it is worth paying attention to whether major banks in China will collapse in the future and whether the bank executives will queue up and jump off buildings like Gong Donji. Financial Collapse in China, Rise of the Warlords China is currently experiencing the emergence of a second wave of financial crises, marked by the successive collapses of both real estate companies and shadow banks. Growing apprehension surrounds the escalating risks within the banking sector, heightened by the Chinese Communist Party's vigorous efforts to purify the financial landscape, resulting in the downfall of numerous financial executives in recent weeks. Analysts issue a stark warning, indicating that China's economy is precariously poised on the brink, grappling with impending and severe financial turmoil. 
should central finances remain elusive for local regions, pushing them to seek independent financial resources, the ominous specter of a scenario reminiscent of the regional separatism during the late Qing dynasty looms large. Massive shadow banking system collapse sparks comprehensive financial crisis. As previously reported, on December 9, Gong Donji, the head of Hua Xiao Bank's Tianjin branch, was confirmed by the police to have died after falling from a building, with speculation suggesting overwhelming stress leading to the tragic death. Commenting on this issue, Ms. Guijun, the chief editor of the Epic Times, mentioned in the elite forum that Hua Xiao Bank has an exceptionally high non-performing loan ratio, with visible losses exceeding 40 billion yuan, about 5.65 billion US dollars, and the undisclosed losses are unknown. The CCP is currently conducting extensive investigations and purges in the financial sector. According to reporters, as of last week, over 90 financial executives have fallen, with an additional 20 within the past two weeks. Corruption in the financial industry cannot be isolated, as managing the fund chain requires cooperation from both upstream and downstream entities and the entire bureaucratic ecosystem. The death of the head of Hua Xiao Bank's Tianjin branch might be an attempt to escape responsibility or a forced death to sever a financial link. After his death, the subsequent investigation might be hindered. There is a saying, one investigation, one death. Saving a business, a family, and preserving assets are often the motivations behind this. However, according to Ms. Go Jun, the issues caused by the shadow banking system might be even more significant, and the impact on CCP politics could be more considerable. The shadow banking system comprises non-banking financial institutions, including various wealth management companies, trust companies, and insurance companies. Over the past two years, both domestically and internationally, there has been much discussion about the problems with the shadow banking system. Currently, the financial assets of the shadow banking system in mainland China are enormous, accounting for about 70 to 80 percent of bank assets. The actual situation is unknown, even to central and local governments. The issue now is that while banks have strict regulatory procedures and laws, such as the central bank directly regulating deposit reserves and guiding bank deposit interest rates, the risk management of the banking industry is relatively mature. However, the shadow banking system lacks such supervision, reserves, and regulations regarding the return on investment for trust assets. Most of the funds in the shadow banking system have been invested in real estate and so-called capital operations. The recent two-year decline in real estate prices and reduced transactions means that much money cannot be recovered. Many wealth management products from trust companies are, in reality, linked to local government projects and land development. Now that local governments have no money, and real estate companies have no money, the probability of these investments being in vain is very high. Capital operations are also in a similar situation. Just look at the A share market, all the world's stock markets have risen recently, except for China's stock market, reflecting China's economic downturn. Once the economy collapses and companies go bankrupt, these investments will also be in vain. A senior financial professional in China once revealed to NTD television that the high-level CCP intentionally supported P2P platforms, using media outlets and semi-official institutions to promote them. Then, banks packaged bad debts and sold them to P2P platforms. At its peak, there were nearly 5,000 legally registered P2P online lending platforms. The government allowed P2P platforms to package these non-performing assets for financing, selling them to unsuspecting investors. The funds raised ultimately went back to the banks. Now, the financial crisis has effectively shifted to investors, as the collapse of P2P platforms has left many people with nothing. The critical issue is that the funds in the shadow banking system mainly come from China's wealthy class, including the middle class and the country's rich elite. The bosses, top executives, and investors in the shadow banking system are also the most concentrated group of CCP second-generation reds and official second-generation. In relative terms, this group has a more significant impact on social and political matters. 
Currently, the CCP attributes all responsibility to P2P platform tycoons. In the past two months, several major cases in China's internet finance industry have been sentenced, with several miraculous rising stars in P2P online lending being sentenced to life imprisonment. If the shadow banking system encounters significant problems, it means this group is in trouble. With no money left, some people may fight desperately. Therefore, the financial professional predicts that in the next year or two, there may be some unexpected political events in China, which may surprise everyone. Capital flight, financial depletion, and a resurgence of regional separatism akin to the late Qing dynasty. Mr. Wu Jialong, Taiwan's prominent economist, conveyed in the elite forum that Moody's recent downgrade of China's sovereign wealth credit rating, encompassing Hong Kong and Macau, along with the subsequent downgrading of ratings for eight financial institutions, holds significant implications. In this industry, Moody's primary role is to establish its own credit. Failing to provide early signals to clients in the face of potential severe issues in China's future economy would denote incompetence. Thus, Moody's is currently challenging the Chinese government. The purpose is evident, and the resolute signal is clear. Consequently, all investors, major investment entities, European and American funds, referencing Moody's credit ratings will start adjusting, leading to a substantial withdrawal of funds from China. Moody's rating for China at this juncture symbolizes a pivotal milestone. Prior to this, Western capital consistently flowed into China, henceforth, it will steadily withdraw. If incoming funds cease, those already invested will hasten their exit as they won't find buyers later. This creates a vicious cycle, signifying the entire Western financial sector's withdrawal from China, extending beyond the issues of one or two banks. The worsening overall financial environment in China involves substantial foreign investments and financial capital. Foreign investment materializes in two forms, direct investment, entailing establishing factories and opening stores, and financial investment, encompassing the purchase of Chinese investment products. It is now evident that foreign capital is retracting. Not only is direct investment in manufacturing and services diminishing, but financial capital is also receding, primarily through Hong Kong and Shanghai. The parallel decrease in overall fund levels indicates that an issue in one area corresponds to an issue elsewhere. The Huaxia Bank case illustrates the broader macro environment, depicting a contracting financial landscape. A key reason is the withdrawal of Western financial capital from China. As overall fund levels decrease, it becomes apparent that while disguised Ponzi schemes could persist during an ascending economy, they falter when the funds diminish. The trick of using later funds to meet the returns of previous investors can no longer be sustained. As funds from behind fail to arrive, issues from the front will inevitably surface. The initial casualty of fund outflows from China is expected to be the real estate sector, serving as an intermediary between the financial sector and the real economy. A surplus of funds flows into real estate, acting as a point of investment. The real economy, spanning from building materials to engineering units, rental agencies, and home appliances, all connected in a vast chain, is dependent on real estate's intermediary role. As funds begin to dwindle, issues will manifest in this crucial area. Following the real estate crisis, local fiscal revenue diminishes, compensation becomes unattainable, and local finance resorts to seeking funds from the central government. Unfortunately, the central government lacks the ability to facilitate transfer payments. Hence, the fundamental cause of China's financial crisis is fiscal. Essentially, after sustaining finance for two decades using real estate, the issue has reverted to a fiscal problem. The local fiscal crisis is expanding as localities resort to indirect taxation and fund acquisition. For instance, trucks passing through highways are fined for overweight, exemplifying various means employed for fund acquisition. If these measures prove unsustainable, it may lead to localities acting independently, potentially evolving into a new era of regional separatism reminiscent of the late Qing dynasty. 
Each locality would have to find means to generate funds to maintain its civil service, creating a situation where local governments, no longer adhering to the central government's directives, gain strength, potentially leading to economic separatism. Mr. Wu Jialong asserts that China's financial challenges and the underlying debt crisis are fundamentally fiscal problems. As we've reported before, rumors suggest that Xi Jinping plans to compel the second generation of elites to relinquish wealth, indicating a continuous harvest. If major corporations, foreign capital, and overseas investors evade harvest, attention will likely shift to the second generation of elites. Thus, behind the apparent issues within financial institutions lies an inherent fiscal predicament. Senior editor and lead writer Sher Shan from the Epoch Times expressed in the Elite Forum that the ongoing economic crisis in China evokes a sense of an economic perfect storm, where all factors converge towards a singular objective, collapse, a steep and cliff-like breakdown. The imminent significant economic collapse is anticipated to catalyze a political upheaval. China, with its politics and economy intricately interwoven in such a structure, seems tightly bound together with iron chains, forming a system where the overall situation appears extraordinarily and exceptionally alarming. Three major A-share indexes plunge collectively, northbound funds withdraw nearly billions. The three major A-share indices collectively experienced a significant decline, each falling by over 1% in the closing session. The Shanghai Composite Index once again dropped below the 3,000-point threshold, and northbound funds, including Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect, witnessed a net outflow of 9.6 billion yuan. Analysts are indicating that foreign funds exhibited complete impatience today, leading to a massive sell-off surpassing billions, resulting in an exit of nearly 20 billion yuan over the past three days. On December 13, all three Chinese A-share indices witnessed a collective decline, and the Shanghai Composite Index dipped below the 3,000-point mark once more. By half-past two in the afternoon, there was no intervention from any mysterious fund supporting the market. At the closing bell, the Shanghai Composite Index had declined by 1.15%, the Shenzhen Component Index by 1.54% and the Chinext Index by 1.66%. Northbound funds experienced a net outflow of 9.6 billion yuan. Liquor stocks performed sluggishly, with several, including Luzhou Laojiao and Kuaichao Matai, facing declines. Leading the downturn were sectors such as batteries, pork, and food, even the real estate sector witnessed a downturn. On the social platform X, financial blogger Uncle Bao noted, foreign funds exhibited complete impatience today, resulting in a massive sell-off exceeding billions and an almost 20 billion yuan exit over the past three days. Although the Central Economic Work Conference maintains a relatively optimistic outlook for next year, there is no indication of a large-scale stimulus being implemented. So everyone's question is, how can this goal be achieved without stimulus? Additionally, with Tesla on the brink of losing its eligibility for US subsidies and related industrial chains facing withdrawal pressure, it has created today's unfortunate scenario of both the Mao Wang line and Ning Wang line jointly impacting the market. Trading coins for friendship? CCP leaders' Vietnam visit with a grand gift package draws attention. Following the significant improvement in diplomatic relations between the United States and Vietnam, the leader of the CCP is scheduled to undertake a state visit to Vietnam from December 12 to 13, bringing with him a noteworthy big gift package that has garnered attention. In more detail, on December 10, Chinese ambassador to Vietnam, Xiong Bo, conveyed to Vietnamese media that during Xi Jinping's visit, China and Vietnam are anticipated to sign numerous agreements. China is open to furthering access for Vietnamese agricultural products and providing funding for the enhancement of the railway connecting Guangxi to Hanoi. Additionally, there will be an expedited development of other railway systems linking the two countries. Furthermore, Xiong articulated China's willingness to fortify economic, trade, and investment cooperation with Vietnam. 
This includes deepening collaboration in industrial and production capacity, as well as promoting practical cooperation in areas such as the digital economy, new energy, and infrastructure. This visit by Xi Jinping marks his second to Hanoi in six years and coincides with the 15th anniversary of the establishment of a comprehensive strategic partnership between the two nations. Both being communist countries, the CCP and Vietnam consider themselves comrades and brothers. However, recent developments, particularly Vietnam's strengthening ties with the United States and Japan, have subtly influenced the dynamics between the two nations. Particularly, the perception of the CCP among the Vietnamese people is notably unfavorable. According to a 2017 survey by the Pew Research Center, Vietnam holds the least favorable view of the CCP among Asia-Pacific countries. Someone shows middle finger while welcoming Xi in Vietnam, CCTV deletes footage. When leaders of the Chinese Communist Party travel to other nations, Chinese embassies often resort to both threats and incentives to compel local Chinese residents into demonstrating support. Recently, there was a notable incident at an airport in Vietnam. On December 12, Beijing time, Xi Jinping visited Vietnam and landed at the airport in Hanoi. CCTV's news platform promptly aired a video lasting approximately 33 seconds, featuring a line of people ostensibly welcoming the delegation at the airport. The majority of people in the video wore forced smiles and vigorously waved small red flags. However, around the 12-second mark in the video, a woman in the crowd raised her middle finger, a gesture signifying contempt, pointing it diagonally forward. Netizens, upon discovering this, engaged in animated discussions, ridiculing the CCP for this embarrassing blunder. Some even speculated that repercussions awaited someone within the party for this accident. In response, CCTV promptly edited and removed the footage and also removed the relevant pages. Other media outlets under party control either did the same. As indicated by numerous prior reports, when CCP leaders travel abroad, Chinese embassies leverage local Chinese student organizations to pressure students through coercion or financial incentives. They may also enlist local Chinese residents to demonstrate support. Many individuals participating in these welcoming events are not volunteers. During Xi Jinping's recent visit to San Francisco, USA, Overseas organizations orchestrated a sizable protest, and the number of individuals mobilized by the CCP was substantial. CCP's leader visit to Vietnam is abnormal. Amid a crisis in the Chinese economy, the top leader of the CCP, Xi Jinping, has recently displayed unusual behavior. According to Bloomberg, the essential annual economic conference from December 11 to 12th, taking on the crucial task of shaping next year's economic agenda, attended by the top CCP leadership was only partially conducted as she left for Vietnam, marking another deviation from the norm. This is also the first instance since she assumed power that he did not fully attend the Central Economic Work Conference. Earlier reports from Bloomberg quoted sources indicating that Xi's visit to Vietnam was initially scheduled for December 14 to 16 but was later rescheduled to December 12 for unknown reasons. Previously, Xi unexpectedly skipped a speech at the BRICS Leaders Summit in South Africa, with the Minister of Commerce delivering the address. She also intentionally avoided attending the G20 summit in September, and the CCP postponed the third plenary session responsible for shaping long-term economic policies. These departures from standard practices have undermined investor confidence. The report quoted Neil Thomas, a China political researcher at the Asia Society Policy Institute, stating, each individual deviation from established practices is not particularly significant. However, when they accumulate, they create a more unpredictable policy environment and a business environment with less confidence. China's economy may be in great turmoil next year. Bloomberg's recent analysis of the Chinese economy has pointed to signs of deflation, signaling a significant vulnerability in China's economic landscape. Official data released by the CCP last week revealed a consistent year-on-year -year decline in the Consumer Price Index. 
The Wall Street Journal's report on December 12 emphasized that not only did China's deflation in November fail to alleviate, but it intensified, posing challenges for the government in reviving the economy. Economists have been consistently cautioning the CCP government about the dangers of deflation, urging measures to avoid a liquidity trap where reduced consumer spending triggers an economic downward spiral. Mr. Su Chenggang, a senior researcher and economist at Stanford University's China Economic and Institutional Research Center, highlighted the limited policy measures available globally to combat deflation, making it the most dreaded scenario for all market economies. Unlike Japan's experience with deflation within a democratic constitutional framework, China operates under communist authoritarian rule, where private enterprises lack ownership of even an inch of land. Xi Jinping, the party leader, is indifferent and lacks an understanding of the economy, with his primary concern being the preservation of CCP rule. When he is concerned about potential color revolutions, both foreign and domestic private enterprises become adversaries of the CCP. Mr. Su outlines three major possibilities for China under deflation. The first is the most optimistic, a palace coup similar to that in 1978, but with a small probability. The second possibility is a financial crisis leading to fiscal, economic, and social crises, constituting a comprehensive crisis. The third significant possibility is the government using administrative means to delay crises, such as market non-operation, leading to the closure of private enterprises, leaving only state-owned enterprises, potentially reverting to the old path of the Soviet Union. However, when the Soviet Union deteriorated to a certain extent, it eventually collapsed. Regarding whether deflation will occur in China, scholars have different interpretations, but there's a convergence in judgments about the direction of Chinese society. According to the self-media outlet Financial Truth, the continuous decline in China's consumer price index is not deflation but a result of the overall economic decline. In the context of economic recession, Chinese citizens are cutting unnecessary expenses, hesitating to spend on clothing, food, housing, and transportation. The three categories with the most significant decline are vegetables, pork, and transportation. Financial Truths Analysis emphasizes that the trend of the China Consumer Price Index in previous years shows that the second half of each year is the peak consumption season for the Chinese people. Even during the three-year period of the pandemic, this trend persisted. However, this year showed a clear deviation. From July to September, the China Consumer Price Index consistently turned downward, indicating a major collapse in the Chinese economy. Starting in the summer, China's economy entered a massive recession under passive balance sheet reduction, aligning with Xi's call for financial stability and the comprehensive debt of local governments. Examining changes in China's consumer prices over the past 20 years, Financial Truth contends that China is experiencing inflation rather than deflation, especially in essential areas such as food, water and electricity, education, and rent. A straightforward example is the Xiaobing, means Chinese sesame flatbread, index. In the past, a piece of Xiaobing cost 50 cents, and now it costs 2 yuan, about 28 cents. This serves as a method employed by the CCP to extract wealth by controlling the fundamental needs of the people. Financial Truth estimates that the just-concluded Central Economic Work Conference of the CCP indicated a focus on stimulating consumption, suggesting that next year, the CCP is likely to implement significant monetary easing. This is a significant gamble, and if it goes wrong, the entire Chinese economy will be in chaos, potentially leading to street movements similar to those in 1989. The CCP's National Development and Reform Commission has been doing this for the past 20 years but has never dared to take the lead. However, this time marks a potential turning point in a major upheaval. Xi Jinping pressures second generation red for financial aid in emergency, threatens, resorting to measures. On December 12, a screenshot uploaded on the overseas social platform X showed a whistleblower, a flying jumping fish, claiming that the CCP leader is demanding the Red Second Generation Group to hand over at least one-third of their wealth to help the central government through tough times. If they don't comply, he will take measures. 
A flying jumping fish indicated that the economic crisis has begun to force the CCP leader to shake his core support base. I have indeed seen the counterattack and protests of the Red Second Generation Group through several channels. He cannot restart the economic flow, so he is targeting existing wealth. This is why I say that social events intensify their internal contradictions, and hence there could be changes. Another ex-user, named Overseas Whistleblower, commented, she is pressuring Red Second families to surrender their assets to help him overcome difficulties. Unable to generate new revenue and deal with Europe and America, he has to make cuts from within. The fortress is most easily breached from the inside. There were earlier rumors that the CCP leader forced wealthy families to hand over part of their assets, with only two families not complying. Wang Huntao, a political scholar and chairman of the National Committee of the China Democracy Party, told the Epoch Times on November 2 that due to the economic crisis facing the CCP regime, the CCP leader is collecting assets from wealthy families. Now, except for two families, all have surrendered part of their wealth in exchange for peace. Wang Huntao revealed that the Zheng Qinghong family has handed over part of their wealth to avoid investigation. Now only two major families can refuse to pay, one is Hu Jintao's, and the other is Jiang Zemin's. All other families have already paid, including Wen Jiabao's. He said that the life of retired CCP leaders is not easy. All senior central officials are essentially under house arrest, and their secretaries, guards, correspondents, drivers, chefs, etc., are all spies. Their meetings and non-meetings all need to be reported. For example, Anbang Group's Wu Xiaowei was sentenced to 18 years in prison in May 2018, and all his properties were confiscated. Wu Xiaowei was the son-in-law of Deng Xiaoping's granddaughter. Around the time he was taken away by the authorities, he signed a divorce agreement with Deng Xiaoping's granddaughter Deng Zhurui. Chen Xiaolu, son of Marshal Chen Yi of the CCP, was rumored to be the backer of Anbang. After Wu Xiaowei was arrested, he suddenly died in Sanya, Hainan, in February 2018. Huaye Real Estate, owned by Zheng Qinghong's niece, fell into a debt crisis due to the authorities' refusal to lend, forcing it to file for bankruptcy. Zheng Wei, Zheng Qinghong's son, was very high profile in Australia in the past but has disappeared in recent years. On September 28 of this year, authorities arrested Evergrande founder Su Jiayin. Su Jiayin was alleged to be Zheng Qinghong's frontman, having a special relationship with Zheng Qinghong's brother Zheng Qinghui and close personal ties with Zheng Qinghong's son Zheng Wei, even lending his Australian mansion to Zheng Wei's parties. Feng Chongyi, associate professor at the University of Technology Sydney, told the Epoch Times on November 6 that the CCP regime has faced an economic crisis in recent years. At the same time, Xi Jinping wants to strike at political enemies, with many wealthy people's money being confiscated. Various families may have surrendered part of their wealth to Xi. He stated that initially, wealthy families allowed Xi Jinping to come to power to preserve the Red regime and their interests. Later, she became dominant, sidelining, marginalizing, and even destroying the original major shareholders and families, causing their dissatisfaction. Now, these families and Xi Jinping are at complete loggerheads. Beijing leadership holds closed-door economic meeting. Reuters, citing four sources, reported that the Chinese Communist Party leaders conducted a closed-door annual Central Economic Work Conference on December 11, focusing on discussing China's economic growth targets and formulating stimulus policies for 2024. The meeting is an attempt to address challenges arising from the intensifying real estate crisis, local government debt, and geopolitical tensions that have led to foreign capital withdrawal. According to official CCP data, until October this year, Institutional investor investments in mainland stocks and bonds decreased by more than 31 billion US dollars, the largest net outflow since China joined the WTO in 2001. Major financial institutions, including American ones, have cut back investments in China, driven by the real estate crisis and restrictive policies.
Prominent hedge funds and private equity firms have reduced their investments in Chinese securities, with mutual funds like Vanguard and Fidelity exiting China entirely. Recently, Liu Jipeng, the dean of the Capital Finance Institute of China University of Political Science and Law, advised retail investors that now is not a good time to speculate in stocks, leading to a ban on his online speech. In addition to Liu Jipeng, some other financial commentators were also banned from the internet. Northeastern University professor Xia Tian warned that the CCP's legitimacy, heavily reliant on economic progress, is at risk due to stagnation and rising unemployment. After the 20th National Congress of the CCP, China's economy is in turmoil, with infighting at the top and a general trend of passivity, or lying flat, among officials and citizens alike. Anders Sorar, a columnist for the Epoch Times' English version, wrote that the current economic chaos in China, with frequent problems, is entirely due to the CCP itself. After demanding banks stop providing funds to real estate developers and creating many other problems, consumer and business confidence in the Chinese economy has been greatly damaged. The CCP is now trying to put the genie back in the bottle, but is failing. Mr. Sorar said that it now seems too late, as the overall economy is collapsing. China's economic momentum has disappeared. Relative to the world, China's population size is shrinking, as is its economy. Thousands of Chinese people are voting with their feet, leaving the country or choosing not to have children in response to the sluggish economy. He criticizes Xi Jinping for his ineffective approach and stubborn adherence to destructive policies, highlighting the CCP's role in not only stalling China's economic growth but also harming international businesses and Hong Kong's financial industry. CCP hits the wall in 2023 diplomacy, experts say, the situation of encirclement has emerged. As 2023 approaches its end, the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, has faced multiple diplomatic setbacks, including issues related to the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, the Russia-Ukraine War, the Israel-Hamas conflict, and human rights abuses. Experts suggest that without significant changes in Beijing's approach, there is little hope for improvement next year. The CCP fears Western countries de-risking. One major diplomatic setback for the CCP in 2023 has been the de-risking measures taken by Western countries to reduce economic ties with China. This concept, introduced by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in March 2023, aims to reduce Europe's dependency on China for critical raw materials and products and counter China's economic coercion. Following this, countries like Germany, France, and the USA have adopted similar strategies. Although not a complete decoupling, these measures focus on limiting China's influence, particularly in high-tech and strategic areas, to prevent potential threats, especially in military and AI sectors. This has led to worsening Sino-European relations. Xing Qinma, director of the Department of Diplomacy and International Relations at Tamkan University, told the Epoch Times, the concept of risk mitigation has become the consistent approach and attitude of democratic countries towards the CCP and has become a world master. The so-called de-risking means that although there is no complete isolation, the so-called partial blockade is implemented on the CCP in strategic and high-tech fields to prevent the CCP from harming the world. The world, especially the military field, industry and artificial intelligence field, Therefore, it can be said that China-U relations is getting worse. In recent months, the U.S. has also emphasized de-risking to reduce dependence on China, focusing on supply chains and technology, without fully decoupling. Under these policies, China has experienced a foreign investment deficit for the first time, with a deficit of $11.8 billion in direct investment liabilities in the third quarter of 2023 the CCP's economic coercion fails. In recent years, countries and regions that have faced economic coercion from the CCP include Lithuania, Japan, Australia, Taiwan, and others. However, the CCP's economic coercion tactics have proven unsuccessful. On December 5, Lithuanian Foreign Minister Landsbergis stated that Beijing has terminated trade sanctions against Lithuania. 
In 2021, Lithuania, one of the three Baltic states in Eastern Europe, established a representative office under the name Taiwan, inviting retaliation from the CCP. China threatened to punish Lithuania economically on the grounds of the name change, resulting in millions of euros in losses in trade with China. However, Lithuania did not make any concessions and received support from Western countries, successfully opening up new markets. Xing Qinmo remarked, This certainly lets the world see that the CCP uses its economy as a weapon to suppress relatively weaker countries. This exposes the true face of the CCP to the world. He stated that Lithuania is not the only one affecting Sino-European relations, the EU has also proposed sanctions against the Chinese Communist Party for human rights violations in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet. Europe and the United States condemn CCP's human rights suppression. Throughout this year, Europe and the United States have consistently publicly criticized the CCP's human rights suppression. December 10 is International Human Rights Day. The EU delegation to China issued a statement, reiterating concerns about China's severe human rights situation, listing various human rights violations by the Chinese Communist Party and condemning the CCP for deliberate, systematic infringement of civil and political rights. On December 8, the United States, ahead of Human Rights Day last Sunday, announced sanctions against two CCP officials and three Chinese companies involved in human rights abuses in Xinjiang and three Chinese companies, including Kafka Sugar. On July 20, the U.S. Congressional Executive Commission on China condemned the CCP's most horrific human rights abuses in an official tweet, urging the unconditional release of all detained Falun Gong practitioners. Xing Ma said, the CCP has always been repressive and persecutory towards freedom and human rights, including the persecution of Falun Gong and the shameful act of live organ harvesting. This part, I think, has awakened more and more people in the world. He mentioned that advanced countries like the United States, Europe, Japan, and South Korea understand the evil nature of the CCP and its oppression of human rights. CCP listed in the axis of evil. China's stance in global conflicts has also drawn criticism. China has not condemned Russia's aggression in the Ukraine war and has maintained close ties with Russia. The U.S. has sanctioned Chinese entities and individuals for supporting Russia. In the Israel-Hamas conflict, China did not condemn Hamas but criticized Israel, leading to suspicions about China's support for terrorist organizations. Most of Hamas's weapon supply comes from Iran, and Hamas also claims to receive support from a mysterious major power. Xing Qinma said, People naturally suspect the involvement of the CCP. Various pieces of evidence point to the CCP because Iran's technology primarily comes from the CCP. Xing Qinma also mentioned another terrorist organization, the Taliban in Afghanistan, which is gaining increasing bilateral ties with the CCP. On September 13, a new Chinese ambassador appointed by the CCP presented credentials to become the first country to establish diplomatic relations with the Taliban. Global Preparedness Against CCP Provocations in the Taiwan Strait Throughout the year, the CCP has been provocatively engaging with Taiwan. In response to China's increasing threats to Taiwan, the international community, particularly the U.S., has heightened its focus on the Taiwan Strait crisis. The U.S. has warned about China's capability to attack Taiwan by 2027, and Taiwan and the U.S. have signed a $17.2 billion arms deal. Japan and South Korea have also shown support for Taiwan, recognizing the interconnected security of East Asia and Taiwan. On October 30, the United States and South Korea conducted a large-scale air exercise, deploying 130 fighter jets to simulate 24-hour wartime operations. Xing Qinma said, Taiwan's entire security system is closely connected with Northeast Asia. If the CCP attacks Taiwan, it's basically difficult for Japan to stay out of it, especially considering the close involvement of the United States and Japan in the region. Formation of the Indo-Pacific Anti-CCP Arc In the Indo-Pacific region, China's aggressive expansion has led to conflicts with the Philippines and other countries. The U.S. and its allies, including the Philippines and Australia, have intensified joint military exercises to counter China's influence. 
the Indo-Pacific Anti-China Alliance is strengthening, and unless there are significant changes in the CCP's policies or a change in governance, this trend is unlikely to change. On November 3, over 1,800 naval marines and personnel from various countries, including the Philippines and the U.S., conducted the 7th Maritime Warrior Cooperation Exercise in Strategic Locations in the South China Sea. Xing Qinhua said, the formation of this military organization by the U.S., the U.K., and Australia basically aims to prevent the CCP's military expansion in the South Pacific after the Cold War. Recently, the U.S. has conducted joint military exercises with the Philippines and Vietnam, as well as military cooperation. Of course, this is to prevent the CCP from causing trouble in the South China Sea. I believe this situation will continue to strengthen, and the free world's containment of the CCP has essentially taken shape. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. Make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths. Thank you.